Skeptics say the Bible contains scientific errors. No, it doesn't, and we'll refute the skeptics' arguments this week on Creation Magazine Live. Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now this week on Creation Magazine Live, our topic is, does the Bible contain scientific errors? Uh, like other shows, most of the content for Creation Magazine Live comes from articles that have appeared in the world-famous Creation Magazine. Now to read some of those articles uh, today's show is based on, go to creation.com slash skeptics Bible errors. You can see some of the content there. Right. Does the Bible say pi equals three? Uh, does it mention unicorns as though they're real animals? Uh, does it say that insects have four legs? Skeptics answer yes to these and other questions about statements found in the Bible. So today, we're going to examine those and no surprise, uh, here the, uh, the Bible skeptics are wrong again. So uh, let, let's start with the question, do rabbits chew their cud? Okay, now we need a bit of a, ba a, bit of, a bit of background here first. The book of Leviticus contains a number of food laws that the ancient Israelites were to obey. Modern medicine has actually shown that there, there were those great health benefits for the people at that time and in that place. Absolutely. Some of the food laws have been attacked by skeptics as proof that the Bible makes mistakes, which then implies that it could not be the Word of God who has all knowledge, of right. course. So, for example, Leviticus 11, 3 to 5 says, Whatever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed and chews the cud among the animals you may eat. Nevertheless, among those that chew the cud or part the hoof, you shall not eat these. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. And the rock badger, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. All right, so the skeptic's concern with, is, is with, with verse 6 where it says, and, and the hare, says there, the hare, because it chews the cud but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. But wait a minute, rabbits don't chew the cud, do they? That's, that's the issue. Right. In modern English, animals that chew the cud are called ruminants. They, they, they hardly chew their food at first and then swallow it and it passes into a special stomach where it's partially digested and then it's regurgitated and chewed again and swallowed into a different stomach. That's what's going on there. Right. So animals that uh, do this include cows, sheep, and goats, and they all have four stomachs or stomach chambers, but not rabbits. So rabbits are not ruminants in this modern sense. So what's the solution? Is the Bible wrong here? This is a problem. So no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> chewing the cud now has a more restrictive meaning than it did in Moses' day. The Hebrew phrase for chew the cud simply means raising up what has been swallowed. Uh, Linnaeus, the, the father of modern classification, and, and a creationist, by the way, uh, at first classified conies and rabbits as ruminants because they do re-eat their partially digested food, but the food takes a slightly different path before being re-eaten. <laughs> right. So rabbits and hares practice refection, which is essentially the same principle as rumination, and does uh, indeed raise up what has been swallowed, right. which is what is meant by the Hebrew words Moses used. So the food goes right through the rabbit and is passed out as a special type of dropping. These are re-eaten, and the rabbit can get more nourishment from the partly di digested food. Now, another name for this process is called cecotrophy. Cecotrophy is the act of eating the cecotropes, or soft feces. In the rabbit, small fiber particles are selected in the GI tract and sent to the cecum where they're fermented to synthesize proteins and vitamins that'll be part of the cecotropes. And these are then expelled and re-eaten. So the function of cecotrophy is to provide the rabbit with the proteins and vitamins that were synthesized in the cecum and, pre and prevents these nutrients from being lost. It's a very important process because it can provide up to 20% of their daily uh, protein requirements. Yeah, so it's, it's not an error of scripture that chewing the cud now has a more restrictive meaning than it did in Moses' day. As it turns out, rabbits and hares do indeed chew the cud, although not in the same way that, that true ruminants do. Right. So once again, the Bible's right and the skeptics are wrong. God, through Moses, was giving instructions that any Israelite could follow. It's 
kind of inconceivable that someone familiar with the Middle Eastern animal life would make an easily corrected mistake about rabbits. Right. It's equally inconceivable that the Israelites would have accepted Leviticus as scripture if it were contrary to observation, but of course it's not. Right. This is the kind of information you get in Creation Magazine. We just summarized an article that was in the magazine way back in 1998. Uh, it includes articles about animals and plants, about nature, archaeology, uh, or, or other articles about different areas of science, and articles about the Bible, of course. The goal of the magazine is to show how the Bible can be trusted right from the very first verse. And in doing so, it builds the faith of Christians. It answers questions that skeptics bring, uh, bring up, like, like the one about rabbits chewing the cud and so on, uh, that might cause Christians to doubt God's word. If you have a mailing address anywhere in the world, we can get the magazine to you. So if you want to sign up, go to creation.com. Uh, we're going to take a break, and then we'll get back to answer another question about the Bible. One of the remarkable things about the geologic record is that blankets of sediments cover vast areas of the continents. In his book, The Nature of the Stratigraphical Record, evolutionary geologist Professor Derek Agar marveled at the way sedimentary layers extended for thousands of kilometers even across continents. He was particularly impressed with the chalk beds that form the famous White Cliffs of Dover in southern England, as these trace all the way to Turkey and Egypt. The strata exposed in the walls of the Grand Canyon provide another example. Some of these sedimentary formations extend thousands of kilometers across North America. Such vast sedimentary layers suggest that geological processes must have occurred in the past that we don't observe today. Sedimentary deposits forming today are localized and confined to river deltas, lake beds, and along narrow strips of coastline. Sedimentary blankets covering vast areas are exactly what we would expect if the global flood recorded in the Bible actually occurred. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in this week, we were talking about does the Bible contain scientific errors? And we just summarized an article answering the skeptics' attacks on scripture about rabbits chewing the cut in the context of clean and unclean animals. And here's another related question Are praying mantises kosher? Yeah, well, um, it, that, that's the title of another article from Creation Magazine back in 2010. Mm -hmm. And it, it's now on the website if you want to read it at creation.com slash kosher. So we're, we're, we're talking here about eating insects, right? Yeah, kind of gross. <laughs> I mean, to most Westerners, the idea of eating insects is so disgusting that, uh, you know, they, they find it surprising that God would have had to give Moses a law to forbid it. Right. But uh, Levi Leviticus 11.20 says, All winged insects that go on all fours are detestable to you. All right, many evolutionists scoff at the Bible. And this is a, a text they, they love to mock. <laughs> For example, Dr. Gilbert Waldbauer, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Entomology, that's the study of insects, at the University of Illinois and a member of the Society for the Study of Evolution, takes a, a swipe at Moses here. He says this, the specification of creeping things that go on all fours is a bit confusing. Insects have six legs, but the author of Leviticus seems not to have noticed that. Right. So is Waldbauer right? Uh, actually, hmm. no, because there are insects, all of which have six legs, which do indeed walk on all fours. How so? Well, the ultimate author of Leviticus, the creator of all the original insect kinds about 6,000 years ago, also inspired Moses to qualify the description of insects that walk on all fours in the next two verses. So Leviticus 11, 21 and 22 says, Yet among the winged insects that go on all fours, you may eat those that have jointed legs above their feet, with which to hop on the ground. Of them you may eat the locust of any kind, the bald locust of any kind, the cricket of any kind, and the grasshopper of any kind. Okay, now it's interesting to note that Dr. Waldbauer acknowledges that the first two pairs of grasshopper's legs are of the walking type, but the hind legs are very evidently modified for jumping. Hmm. Well, that matches uh, what Leviticus actually says. It, that is, just because we call them legs, it doesn't follow that the Hebrews did. Right. They, they tended to classify uh, things according to function. Right. Right. So it's a chronological snobbery to dismiss this classification as wrong. Indeed, it's absurd even on the face of it to think that the Hebrews didn't notice the prominent limbs when they were, you know, considering eating them. Right. Yeah. Uh, there are, there are, are there any other insects? 
uh, we, could, we could ask, that walk on all fours. Well, praying mantises, as we mentioned before, hold the front pair of their legs up in front of them in a, in a prayerful pose. Mm -hmm. And these legs, have uh, they're, they're covered with sharp barbs, which help the mantises catch their food. When another insect walk, walks past, the mantis's front legs whip out and capture lunch, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it uses its rear forelegs for walking. Right, so imagine an ancient Israelite. You know, he, he finds a praying mantis, right? Okay. So he, he knows that the law of Moses bans eating nearly all insects, except for some that walk on all fours. All fours. Well, yeah. here's an insect, a praying mantis that walks on all fours, so does he eat it? No, because praying mantises do not have jointed legs for hopping on the ground. So it's dependent on the, uh, it depended on the leg function that indicated if it was okay to eat. Okay, so based on leg function, praying mantises aren't kosher, <laughs> but locusts are. Yeah. Uh, some of you might be asking, well, why did God allow the eating of locusts but not praying mantises? Well, one factor may have been uh, the insect's uh, diet. Locusts are herbivores, while most carnivores are designated unclean in the law of Moses. Right. Another uh, factor could maybe related to God's mercy. Remember that uh, locusts could devastate crops, yeah. leaving famine in their wake, and e e even in the midst of God, uh, judgment, God was gracious and let Israel eat this protein-rich food source. Yeah, um, and they can have it. Um, <laughs> I'll get my protein somewhere else. Yeah. Kind of thing, you know. but, but, but hey, there are people today who love them. Uh, here, here's some, some Thai fried grasshopper, a favorite street food in Thailand. And in Mexico, you can get grasshopper tacos. You can Yuck. see pictures there. That picture on the right is actually from a restaurant in New York that serves grasshopper tacos. Or you could just have them as a snack. Uh, sort of like popcorn while you're watching the game type of thing. Okay, well, <laughs> moving on. Uh, let's look at another verse that... Uh, yeah, skeptics have uh, attacked. Does the Bible mention unicorns as real animals? And okay, okay. We'll, we'll get into that after a short break. The Genesis account is the Rolls Royce of creation books. It's a thorough verse-by-verse -verse analysis of the first 11 chapters of Genesis, revealing what the text means. Unlike most commentaries, it includes the additional step of providing cutting-edge scientific support for the history recorded in Genesis because its author, Dr. Jonathan Safady, is a PhD scientist. Since science confirms the truths in God's Word, if both are properly interpreted, this nearly 800-page book makes a fantastic reference tool for pastors or anyone wanting to know what Genesis really means. Order your copy at creation.com. Okay, on this week's episode, we're talking about supposed scientific errors in the Bible. Skeptics mm -hmm. will use whatever they can, fair or foul, to attempt to discredit God's Word. Right, and of course, our, our focus as a ministry is on the creation evolution issue, but it's really about the authority of the, the whole Bible. So, it is. Um, you know, we, just, we focus on Genesis because it's an area where many attacks, of course, against the Bible are focused. But, but this week, we're looking into other areas of Scripture that have been attacked. So, so let's have a look at the mention of unicorns in the King James uh, translation of the Bible. Okay, in Job 39, 9 and 10, it says, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee, or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow, or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Okay, so, so what's going on here? Right. Um, is the Bible referring to fantasy animals as having really existed? Right, because the unicorn is also mentioned in uh, other passages, and uh, nowhere in these passages is there any suggestion that anything other than a real animal is being described. Okay, uh, but the unicorn is well known to be a, project, a, a product of legend. Yeah. Uh, no unicorn remains have ever been found, and there are fabulous tales told about these mythical creatures. Some have been used. Some, some, have been, some of these tales have been used to attack the Bible, saying that this proves that the Bible writers were simply retelling wildly believed myths. Right. Well, it's well known that the uh, that unicorn horns were greatly prized because of the belief that they were able to render poisons harmless. For yeah. example, sailors occasionally found the tooth of a of a male narwhal washed up and, and assumed it was the only remaining part of a once living unicorn. Uh, a narwhal, by the way, is an uh, arctic whale, and the male of which has a long, spirally twisted tusk. A couple of artists in California made these two-foot-long resin sculptures, playfully revealing where narwhals get their horns. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so huge prices were often paid for these. Um, Queen Elizabeth I is said to have had one which was valued at ten, uh, 100,000 pounds. 100,000 pounds. Uh, as shipping became more widespread, it became clear that these, these unicorn horns were actually, nar uh, actually whale's teeth and that had a dramatic effect on uh, market prices. <laughs> uh, but what 
was the animal described in the Bible as a unicorn? That's what we want to get to. Right. The most important point to remember is that while the Bible writers were inspired and infallible, translations are another thing altogether. Mm, that's right. The word used in Hebrew is reem. And this has been translated into various languages as monoceros, unicornus, unicorn, einhorn, and, and einhorn, all of which mean one horn. However, the word reem is not known to have such a meaning. Right. Many Jewish translations simply left it untranslated um, because they were not sure which uh, creature was being referred to. Right. But there's a way of showing from the King James Version itself that the translation of the Hebrew reem as unicorn is incorrect. In Deuteronomy 33, 17, Moses speaks uh, a blessing on the descendants of Joseph saying, in majesty, he is like a firstborn bull. His horns are like the horns of a wild ox. And the word for wild ox here is the Hebrew word reem. Okay, so the, the King James Version translation, it says, his glory is like the firstling of his bullock and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. Right. Now, the King James translators had a dilemma here because elsewhere they had determined that reem was unicorn. The problem is, in the Hebrew of this passage, the word horns is plural, horns, mm. but the word reem is singular. But if they had translated it in this way, it would read uh, like his horns are like the horns of a unicorn, <laughs> that make which sense. would give the unicorn more than one horn and obviously a contradiction in terms. Right, and the King James uh, translators clearly recognize the inconsistency in comparing the pair of horns, plural, on a bull with the single horn on a unicorn, which that's what it means, one horn, yeah. because they took the liberty in their translation to make the unicorn plural. Uh, there's a marginal note in the King James Version which makes this clear, but it needs to be stressed again that the word they uh, translated, unicorns, is not plural in the Hebrew. Unless one grants a, an English translation authority over the original Hebrew, yeah. this is a, a, a once and for all indication that the reem could not be a one-horned creature. Right, also in modern Hebrew, reem means wild ox, and that's likely the way it ought to be translated in biblical Hebrew as well. Yeah. So that solves the issue of unicorns mentioned in the, in the Bible. Now, can you see a pattern here? Well, the pattern is, is that the skeptics' attacks are usually focused on a surface meaning of the text with a, a little attempt to dig deeper. And the solution, as we've shown in these three examples now, is if you dig a little deeper, the argument against God's word actually disappears. Yeah, you could say, I guess, a little knowledge is dangerous. Mm. In the case of the rabbits, a little more detail about ra how rabbits actually eat uh, cleared that problem up. Paying closer attention to the text of Scripture and knowing a bit about insects helped to get a solution there. And in this last case, it was a simple translation error in English. Right. And so there's no issue with the original language of the Bible. And we'll be back shortly with another one. Ever since the discovery of the first Neanderthal remains in 1856, scientists have debated how to classify these mysterious, quite human-like creatures. Until recently, many evolutionists were confident that Neanderthals were not fully human, and they regarded them as a subhuman species called Homo neanderthalensis. However, recent genetic research shows that modern humans and Neanderthals interbred, suggesting that Neanderthals and people living today should be classified as the same species. After sequencing the Neanderthal genome, the world the world's leading authority on ancient DNA, Savante Paabo, concluded, Many would say that a species is a group of organisms that can produce fertile offspring with each other and cannot do so with members of other groups. From that perspective, we had shown that Neanderthals and modern humans were the same species. Neanderthals were humans, not ape men, contrary to 150 years of storytelling. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, our subject this week is, does the Bible contain scientific errors? Does it make mathematical errors? Uh, the next one we'll look at is a verse in uh, 1 Kings that skeptics say results in pi equaling 3 rather than 3.14159, etc. Yeah. Now, just to clarify, there are two good reasons that we as Christians need to be able to answer those sorts of challenges from skeptics. The first one is that we need to continually remove obstacles stumbling blocks that might prevent us from fully applying God's Word to our lives. Uh, if, if there is something that you've heard from skeptics that causes you to doubt Scripture, 
then deal with it. There are so many good resources available today to refute the skeptics' attacks. There really are. That's right. And the second reason is basically evangelism. We need to be sure of Scripture ourselves, but moving beyond that, we want to show people who don't believe the Bible that they can trust it as the actual communication from God about what He's done to save sinners. Yes. And uh, uh, both of those are really important goals of this show and, and, and of course, of all of Creation Ministries and what we do. Right. Uh, okay, so the, the verse in question is 1 Kings 7.23. It says this, He made the sea uh, of cast metal circular in shape, measuring 10 cubits from rim to rim and 5 cubits high. It took a line of 30 cubits to measure around it. Now, can you see the problem? Uh, maybe those of you who haven't been in, in math class for a while, <laughs> you might need a bit of a refresher. Yeah. Okay, so circumference, the circumference of a circle is found with the formula circumference equals pi d, or 2 pi r. So pi equals the circle's circumference divided by its diameter. Right, but if we apply that here, we get a result of 3, three. not yes. pi. And so once again, if we, if we dig just a little deeper here, we're going to find out that there are at least two possible explanations. Right, yeah, the first concerns the meaning of the word cubit and how that would have been used in measuring the, this particular vessel. The cubit was the, the length of a man's forearm from the elbow to the outstretched fingers. Uh, the, now, a Hebrew cubit was about 45 centimeters or 18 inches. It's obvious that a man's forearm doesn't readily lend itself to <laughs> measuring in fractions of a forearm or fractions of a cubit, right? right. And in the Bible, half a cubit is mentioned several times, but there's no mention of a third part of a cubit or a fourth part of a cubit, even though these fractions of a, a third part and a fourth part were used in volume and weight measurements. Right. So it seems likely that any measurement of more than half a cubit would have been counted as a full cubit, and any measurement of less than half a cubit would have been rounded down to the nearest you know, cubit. Seems to make sense. Yeah, yeah. from 1 Kings 7.23, uh, a line of 30 cubits did compass it around about, it, it appears that the circumference was measured, measured with a line or a piece of string or rope on which the distance may have been marked like a, like a ruler, or the length would have been measured off in cubits by, by the measurer using maybe his own forearm or somebody else's or maybe even a cubit long rod that had been made up. Right. So if the actual diameter was 9.65 cubits, for example, this would have been rounded to 10 cubits. The actual circumference would then have been 30.32 cubits, and this would have been rounded to 30 cubits. So a 9.6 cubit diameter gives a circumference of 30.14. Right. The, the, the ratio of true circumference to true diameter would then have been 30.32 uh, times 9.65 9 equals 3.14. And so there, there we have the true value of pi, even though the measured value, that, that is to the nearest cubit, was 30 and 10 and 3. You get those numbers there. So that's, the, that's, that's one solution anyway. Right. And then there's a, a second possibility, yes, of course. Yes, there is. And um, verse 26 of 1 Kings 7 says that the vessel in question had a brim, which was a hand's breadth in thickness, and its rim was like the rim of a cup, like a lily blossom. So it's believed by Bible scholars to have looked like this. You can see it here. Okay, so let's consider the details given in 1 Kings 7.23 and Chronicles 4.2. Uh, these are, one, the distance, or the diameter rather, of 10 cubits was measured from brim to brim, that's verse 23. So from the topmost point of the brim of one side to the topmost point of the brim of the other side, uh, points A and B there in the diagram. Right. So the circumference of 30 cubits was measured with a line, round about. You see that in verse 23. The most natural meaning of these words is that they refer to the circumference of the outside of the main body of the tank, measured by a string pulled tightly around the vessel below the brim. It's very obvious that the diameter of the main body of the tank was less than the diameter of the top of the brim right. for a measuring, uh, measured circumference of about 30 cubits. So we can calculate that the external diameter of the vessel would have been at that point from the formula diameter equals circumference equals pi. So that's 30 cubits, 3.14, which gives us 9.55 cubits. Okay. Uh, so the external diameter of the vessel at the point below the rim where the circumference was measured must have been 9.55 cubits. Right. Uh, so, so there you have a couple of solutions 
to this supposed problem. The Bible doesn't defy geometry. It doesn't say that pi equals three. <laughs> yeah, it's the skeptics who state that the Bible's wrong who are wrong yeah. <laughs> because they fail to take into account all the data. The Bible's reliable and apparent discrepancies vanish when you examine them more closely. And we'll be right back. Many Christians today have a diminished view of the Bible because they can't answer questions like, is there really a God? What about evolution? Are there facts to back up the Bible? Or is it all just faith? Creation Ministries expert speakers visit churches all over the world to help pastors equip their congregations to understand that the whole Bible, even Genesis, is accurate. We help to demolish the arguments that the world uses to try to convince people that the Bible isn't true. For more information on getting a CMI speaker to visit your church, contact your nearest CMI office through our website. Welcome back. This is the feedback section. We often get feedback uh, from our website on different articles we do or et cetera, shows that we do. And so here's one called, What is the Problem with Starlight and Transit? That's what we titled it. So here's the, uh, the question. Uh, William M. from the U.S. says, I had a question regarding the article, How Can Distant Starlight Reach Us in Just 6,000 Years? My basic question is, why does it seem inconsistent with God's nature to create the light from a supernova that never existed? It seems the Bible has the same problem, in quotes, <laughs> when it speaks of Christ creating wine from grapes that never existed, or bread from wheat that never existed, or fish too, for that matter. I just wondered if anyone from your organization had ever been asked this question. Uh, has it ever been asked? I did try to find it. Do you have a response? Blessings to you and thanks in advance. Yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot of questions that, uh, about the creation evolution issue that, uh, uh, right. that haven't been asked before, so right. yes, People have asked that question before. The question about starlight and time, that's another one of those questions that skeptics throw up there mm -hmm. to say, well, the Bible can't be true. God couldn't have created recently because it takes billions of years right. for light, for, for photons traveling at the speed of light to get to the, from the very distant objects. But the pro this is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. The problem with this particular one is why couldn't God have created the light beam in transit between the distant object and our telescopes so that we can see it. Right. And Lita responds to this uh, from, from our U.S. office, the, 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 created, the light created in transit, prob that, that's the issue there, it implies a history that never existed. Right. We would be seeing things, God would be showing us things, creating things, events in that beam of light that never took place, which implies right. deception, which is obviously not a part of God's character. So, right. um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of questions like that. Creation Magazine is, is a fantastic resource to answer questions like this and many other questions. Like, like, like we said uh, a few minutes ago, the questions that we did on this show in the last half hour were all already articles in Creation Magazine, some of them from years ago. Right, and there's diff ago. different nuances. The, the way he's asked his questions, often like when somebody asks you, well, couldn't a God have created, you know, God created Adam mature, Right. So doesn't that mean you know we might find evidences of, of, of in the rocks that make it look old and things like that? But you have to differentiate between those those yeah. those two things. And these are the types of things that Creation Magazine deals yeah. with because the questions are constantly coming from the skeptics, and that of course burdens the Christians. Yeah. With, and uh, as, with these as things. far as this is concerned, I mean we're using the terminology God created a fully functional creation, not one with the appearance of age. There's a difference there. Right. Next week on Creation Magazine Live, can certain geologic features be explained by a global flood? See you next week.